Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody joining us today for Takeo Tuesday. Glad you are all joining in, and as everybody's jumping in at the moment, let me just get the screen up and running for everyone so you can see what I've got going on too. So I am glad to see everybody here today uh, while it's still a few of you jumping in. Uh, my name is Dave Holdorf, and welcome to Takeo Tuesday. Uh, and today's topic is a residential focus. And we are focusing on the difference or the great debate between zoning your hydronic systems, whether you're looking at zoning by zone valves or zoning by zone circulators. We are going to put that debate to bed today. Uh, let's just call it what it is. And we're going to finalize it and tell you all how to do your hydronic zoning uh, going on today. So that's the focus for today. I do greatly appreciate everybody logging in. Um, so with that being said, Let's get this show on the road. Uh, if this is one of your first times coming to GoToWebinar, I just want to show you a few things that you want to pay attention to so you know what you got going on with you. Uh, the first thing that you're going to see here is your control panel. Now, if you don't happen to see the control panel like I do on the screen or yours doesn't look like that, I want you to look for that orange arrow. And if it is pointing to the left, I want you to click on it so it expands out to you see this. So when it expands, then you have access to everything on the screen. Um, so this way you can take a look at your audio and making sure the sound is coming from the right spot. Uh, I also want you to take a look at where if there are any handouts. And we do have a couple of handouts there today. Um, and this is where you're going to communicate with us. So everybody's microphone is muted, so don't worry about that. Uh, we've got several hundred of you that have logged, uh, that have registered for today. Uh, so you're going to communicate with us, uh, or mostly just me today, because everybody else is unavailable uh, in the questions chat section. So what I would like everybody to do, if you can find that question chat area, uh, if you could just type in a quick, hi, hello, how are you? Make sure that everything is working properly. Make sure you hit the send button at the bottom right-hand corner. Lots of people type in and then hit enter and nothing comes through. So look for the send button. And I see a whole bunch of them coming through. So excellent, James and Jake and Matt. Wow, this is awesome. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Just, I was, I was uh, questioning for a second whether or not it was working. Um, so everything is good. And I will do that periodically just to make sure that the internet connection is working properly. So if you notice, things look different behind me. If you've been on any webinars with me in the past, I'm in a hotel room up in Massachusetts today. So uh, I'll, I'm back out on the road for the rest of this week. So uh, lots of webinars being done from hotel rooms. Um, so I will ask questions just to make sure I'm not talking to myself. Uh, so good to see you all. Now, if things, uh, if you're on a phone or a tablet, things will look a little bit different. So you'll see the camera um, and you've got a uh, toggle between whether you see the presentation or myself on the screen. Um, so you'll you have to look at one or the other, can't see both of us at the same time. Uh, there's your audio section um, and then there's your question. So you have to toggle between each one of those. So excellent. Uh, hey, hey, John, good to see you. Vince, yes, you finally made it, Vince. Good to see you, brother. Uh, and everybody else, Deb, good to see you too. Awesome. Everybody all over the place, all across the country. And and if you're, while you're typing in too and, and, and getting familiar with it, if you want to just let me know where you are in the entire country right now, if not the world, because uh, I know we are international as a company, um, just let me know that's going on there too. So at the moment, yes, I'm by myself. John is actually in England at the moment, and he is actually an attendee to a training class uh, rather than being a presenter. Uh, and Rick, I believe, is in Canada, Western Canada somewhere, if I remember correctly, doing some training classes today. And myself, I am in uh, upstate, uh, I am northern Massachusetts, uh, near the Vermont, New Hampshire border. I have a presentation later today with OESP uh, this evening. So, uh, Henry, Long Island, same with me, brother. Just not there right now. Just left this morning. So, good to see you. All right. So, zone valves versus zone circulators. All right, the great debate, which one is better? You know, if you had your choice and you were able to zone a system, how would you do it? And I think this is such a great debate. It, 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 I think it rivals which way to put toilet paper on in your house, whether you do an under or an over. Uh, and I'll, I'll do a quick poll there too and ask everybody out there, are you an over or an under person when it comes to your toilet paper in the house? Uh, and and it's, it's, it's a, you know, for some people, it's one way or none. And that is it. 
and you know you go to somebody's house and you just want to be able you just want to flip it the way you've got it right so um i do remember seeing this and i'm sure most of us have seen it also uh, floating around facebook and instagram there was a patent out there um that was listed you know a couple hundred years ago on which way it's supposed to go and yes it is supposed to be an over uh, uh way there brian lucky if it gets on <laughs> excellent excellent um so this is a huge debate and this debate rages on today uh and i and i i'm involved in a lot of different websites and a lot of different chat sections and facebook and instagram and you know you get it, it is almost you know 50 50 out there you know and and those guys that are doing zone valves you know think the guys that are doing zone circulators are crazy and then the guys that are doing you know zone circulators think the zone valves guys are nuts out there you know and if we were to try to get everybody in the house in the, in the room at the same time yeah it's going to come to blows it's just amazing on what we experience out there so yeah it's going to be a rumble you know let's put them all together in the room at the same time and and we're going to rumble but with that being said i do have a question for everybody out there and i'm going to throw a poll up there too at the same time and if you were hydronics king or queen all right and remember if you're queen or king you get to make the rules in the land so if you were the hydronics king or queen how would you zone how would you have everybody out there zone their systems all right so if you can answer that question for me i just love to see what's going on out there matthew i see you typed it in here and, and giles yes um and i set up a poll out there for you to to answer also uh i just love to see what the numbers coming in and right now we've got quite a few coming in uh and i see a few people that are looking at my my third answer there out there and and uh, still selecting it <laughs> that third choice that was out there still small percentage out there and yeah we are you know and i'm looking at it right now and and uh just about half of you has voted out there and we are almost split down the middle we are almost split down the middle right now between zone valves and zone circulators um that's awesome all right and and uh, a few of you have typed in there it depends um yes and uh you know which way is better which way is better all right and i'm going to close that up right now i'm looking at 47 percent zone valves 44 percent zone circs and nine percent said it depends okay so loving it out there thank you very much for everybody for uh participating in that poll and i'm going to turn that off and get it back to let's see okay i'm gonna actually i can share it with everybody you guys can all see that answer i believe there you go so yes, we had a nine, you know, nine percent. It depends, and I said don't select that. You had to pick one or the other. All right, but that's okay. All right. So, with that being said, which one is right? They're both right. All right. There is no one way going to be better than the other when it comes to comfort in the house itself. There's a lot of other arguments that you can put out there, but the biggest thing that you need to remember is when a customer asks you uh, for zoning in their house, what are they really asking for? All right, when they say zones, I want zones in my house, what's the one thing they're really asking for out there? And you really need to pay attention to that uh, on how they, on what they're asking you. So they are not necessarily asking you for a zone valve. They are not asking you for zone circulators. They're not even asking you for comfort because comfort's already given. If you weren't giving them comfort in the house, you shouldn't be there in the first place, right? Um, and I'm sorry, Giles, when I said that like that, it's, it's and, and Carrie and Farshad said it, yes, they're looking for more control over their house, all right? Because right now, most people have no idea what's going on in their basement. All right. And I'm sure most of my contractors out of here, you've gotten a phone call from a customer and says, can you come over and take a look at my furnace? Something's not right. And you show up and there's a boiler there. OK, so remember, the most important piece of mechanical equipment that we put in somebody's home is the thermostat. That is their interface to the stuff that we do downstairs. So they're looking for more control. Yes, it does equal into the comfort part. All right, because then it can turn that temperature up and down and, and detail it to their area uh, and to how they feel in that house. For example, you know, um, you know, when I redid my house, I put in nine zones um, and, and each one of my kids have their own thermostat. Now, my daughter who likes it warm and my son who likes it cold, if I put the two of them on the same thermostat, 
there's going to be battles on where to set that thermostat to make either one of them comfortable. So, um, so yes, comfort does come into play when it is looking at uh, how many zones to go into somebody's house, but how to do it, there is no right or wrong answer. Um, everybody has their own reason, and there are very good reasons on both sides, and we're going to explore that as we go through that today, all right? So remember, it's not personal, it's just business, all right? Uh, we don't need to come to blows, and if you and it works for you and your customer base, great, go for it. If you like to do zone circulators, great, go for it. As long as you understand why and what, what the reasons are, instead of just saying, well, that's the way I've always done it, um, you know, is not necessarily a great reason as long as you understand what's going on behind the scenes, so to speak. And we're going to explore that as we go through it today. So if, if none of them are, you know, if they're both right, why do we run into projects that look like this? Hey, man, I'm a zone pump guy. I'm going to pump the heck out of this job. All right. If I can get more pumps in, I'm going to. At, at one point, I started looking at this. I thought this was a circulator farm. All right. Where we started growing circulators rather than manufacturing. So but you could tell, you know, we've had a couple plucked already and, and new ones are growing in place. All right. I always think about the guy that has to get all the way in the back or this one that had to be replaced over here because these are some older ones, as I can see here. Uh, this one's a little bit newer by the new label on there. Could you imagine having to be that guy to get back in there to do that replacement? A little challenging, a little challenging itself. Now, if you think putting in a, a, a ton of circulators is challenging, um, just think about zone valves. Zone valves can also have issues. OK. Um, and it, it, yes, and if your eyes hurt all of a sudden, yeah, this is, and, and again, where some of these job sites were, I have no idea. These have been pictures that have been sent to me over the last 25 years of doing this stuff. Uh, where they came from, I have no idea any longer. Um, so zone valves can also be a challenging application too, right? As long as we know what we're doing, that's the most important thing uh, when it comes to how you're going to design a system, whether it's zone valves or zone circulators. It all comes down to doing the math, all right? And you guys have all heard this from us many, many times. And, and this is a little bit of a continuation from two weeks ago when John did the class. Uh, we're, you know, we're gonna go and I need to give a little bit of numbers there in case you weren't there two weeks ago. Uh, we gotta take a look at those flow and head calculations. And we need to know what the flow rate is. Otherwise, we're just guessing whether or not one circulator and three zone valves can handle it or do I need everything one circulator can do, all right? And we're going to come back to that universal hydronics formula that we always talk about. GPM equals BTUH divided by delta T times 500. Okay, so let's do one. And let's take a look at our example that we have. We have a 28,000 BTU load with baseboard. And it's a 20 degree delta T. Um, and we're going to keep it 100% water so we can keep the math easy. So we take the numbers. And, and just so you know, just have an idea of 28,000 BTUs of fin tube baseboard. Let's just take out that math for a second and go 28,000 and divide it by, uh, I'm gonna call it 580. And we're looking at about 48 feet of baseboard. All right, so that's a big, big zone. That's a lot of zone that we're looking at right now. 48 feet, all right, of linear feet of actual uh, fin tube baseboard. So 28,000 divided by 20 times 500 gets me 28,000 divided by 10,000. And so my flow rate, for those of you that know the math already and have been to a few of these, probably type that in real fast and you'll know what the, uh, you could see what the answer is immediately. I'm going to pull it up anyway. My flow rate's 2.8 gallons a minute. That's it. We're done. That is your total flow that is needed on a design day for 48 feet of baseboard is 2.8 gallons a minute. All right. That's all we need. Now, the second half to, to sizing our circulator is getting the head loss, all right? And yes, we did a lot of this two weeks ago in, in, in calculating flow and head. Uh, John had shown you uh, a, a little bit harder way, all right? And he was pulling out the copper tube handbook uh, in order to get that. So, and you got really good, but you had to do some work to get the numbers that you needed. Here, I'm gonna do the quick way, all right? And the quick way or the easy way is, is not looking at those charts, basically just getting the length of run of pipe and calling it a day, all right? But we're going to size it on the safe side, all right? We're going to 
get the highest head that system would ever possibly see. All right, so what we want to do is measure the run of pipe. And what I mean by the run of pipe is everything from the circulator out to the system, count the baseboard also, and then up to the suction side of the circulator. So all of the pipe around the circulator. All right, and don't spend a lot of time at this number. All right, this is going to be a quick number. This number should end in either a zero or a five. If you did any other number, you spent too much time doing it. So, you know, if I've got pipe in the wall back there, it's going to be 10 feet. All right, because you got to count the joists on either side. All right. Uh, could it have changed the stud cavity going up and, meet, and meeting to the baseboard on the second floor? Possibly, but we don't know. All right. And most fin two baseboards going to be perimeter. All right, so just follow the perimeter of the house and take the look at the riser and, and coming back down. And that's it. Because then we're going to take that number and multiply it by 1.5. All right, we're going to make it 50% longer to account for all the fittings. So if you were installing baseboard, all right, brand new installation in a house, how many elbows would you put in the house with a piece of fin tube baseboard into one room? All right, it's an interesting question. All right, how many elbows are there? And before, remember what I said, going into that wall cavity, all right? It, it, does it go straight up or do we jump over a stud? All right, and therefore having to put in a couple elbows. Have no idea unless you break out the infrared camera. So how many elbows could be on a piece of baseboard? All right, could be two, could be four, depending on where the, pe the pipe is run from, could be zero, all right? And I, I, I've got a lot of friends out there that are starting to bend their copper pipe and not put in elbows and not put in fittings in an inaccessible area. Because remember, any joint, no matter what joint you make, whether it's a solder, it's a PEX, it's a press connection, all right, a threaded connection is a potential leak threat, all right? So now I've got, I've got lots of friends out there that are starting to bend the copper instead, because every fitting is a potential leak. So let's get rid of it all together. When you have just bent copper, no pressure drop in there, but we don't know it's all behind the walls right here. So we're going to err on the safe side here because then we're going to take that number and multiply it by 04. And what this number represents is four foot of head loss per 100 feet of copper pipe properly sized, also running maximum flow for that pipe size. So we did our heat loss, our flow rate calculation before, and it came up to 2.8 gallons a minute. And that's probably going to be three quarter inch pipe. Now at three quarter inch pipe, our max flow is going to be four gallons a minute, but this number represents four gallons a minute through three quarter inch pipe, 100 feet long, it has four foot of head loss. Okay, I hope that makes sense. And I'll do the math and I'll show you. All right, so we measure the system out and we see we had 85 feet. That's counting the 48 feet of baseboard. All right, rounded it up to 85 to make the math easy. Take that number, multiply it by 1.5, and that tells me I have 128 feet of equivalent length. And then multiply that number by 0.04, and it tells me my head loss is 5.12 foot ahead. Okay, so my circulator demands come in at 2.8 gallons a minute at 5.12 foot ahead. <clears throat> All right, I got a question in from Nick, and he was saying, do you use four foot per 100 feet most of the time? I've mostly seen two feet per 100 feet of pipe. Um, I, I Maximum would be the four foot. I mean, four foot of head loss, all right? That's uh, what was given to, that's also what's in the um, uh, 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 the copper tube handbook that we talked about two weeks ago, uh, is that four foot maximum. You could use two foot of head per 100 feet, but you might be, you know, this is... Uh, you know, giving you that little bit of extra because if you don't know the math, if you don't know the length and stuff like that. So we're erring on the safe side, uh, getting closer. Experience would say, yeah, you could probably get away with two foot. And right now, five five foot ahead is not a lot of head loss. Not a lot of head loss in this zone either. So yes, um, when the way we did it yesterday, uh, two weeks ago with John, I'm sure this number would come in around three, two and a half or three or so, believe it or not. Yes. All right. So that's if we were looking at a zone by pump, 2.8 gallons a minute, 5.12. We're going to take those, we're going to take that number and we're going to apply it to our pump curves. All right. But I'm not going to get there just yet. All right. We're just going to remember this number. We're going to use it throughout the rest of the uh, rest of the presentation tonight. 
uh, today. So let's ask the question now, why zone with circulators? One, why not? Why not zone with circulators? How many zones did we have 50, 60 years ago in most of our homes? One, you had to have at least one circulator on that project, correct, right? So it was easy to zone with circulators because we only had one zone, but now we're starting to see multiple zones as they norm. And as we see that norm coming up and we're saying, all right, why zone with circulators? Well, hey, I already got one there. In order for me to do it again, I'm just gonna repeat what was there. Because you know how you like to pipe out your boilers. You know the certain equipment that you have in this circulator and that boiler and this connection here. And all I need to do is repeat myself because I know I'm familiar with those components as I put them together. So you just do it again. All right. So as we know, circulators are very darn reliable. All right. I, I talked to uh, the engineers back at Taco one day when I first started 10 years ago. And I said, what's the what's the expected lifespan of our circulators of, say, a 007? And they said, well, everybody wants to know years. We've got it equated down to starts how many cycles a product goes through and so we designed double o series circulators to handle 250,000 cycles now in a single zone system that equates out to approximately say you know 17 18 years or so okay um so hey you start looking at that you start and and we all know we've seen circulators running out there a heck of a lot longer sometimes they might you know fail a little bit sooner all right a lot of it does, excuse me, does depend upon the number of cycles in the cycle count that has the, that goes through there. Now, when you do have circulators and zone circulators on a project, you do get a little bit of redundancy. So if one circulator were to go down uh, for whatever reason, now you have at least some other heat in the other side of the house, okay? And there you get that redundancy if need be. So you're not going to be left out in the cold, so to speak. All right. And when you do zone by circulator, it is really hard to undersize. It is it can be hard to undersize um, when you got circulators on there as your main zoning sequence. So uh, all right, cost difference on a typical installation. So the difference between zone valves and zone circulators, you know, when it comes to the end uh, and to the customer at the very end, it could almost be a wash. All right, it gets really close. All right, you, you know, um, we'll 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 dive into that a little bit more uh, 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 out there. So we start looking at zone circulators. One thing about zone circulators, though, does take a little bit more work to do and can actually take up a lot more space on a wall. So they, you know, it's not easy to make you know a whole bunch of circulars easily fit in there. And this project here, very interesting scenario had happened with the customer. All right, now a lot of us look at this and say, wow, that looks impressive. All right, to, you know, and we all know the amount of work it takes to get everything lined up just right, make it all nice and neat, using bent conduit to run the power to each circulator, which is beautiful, you know, a little flex right at the very end. Uh, and we start looking at all those things built in there. We know how hard this is to make it look good. And I remember, uh, and this was back in my old days before I was here at Taco, uh, going to this job site, because this was a very big radiant house. And the homeowners came downstairs and the contractor was just beaming at this work that he had done. And this, this is going back about 15 years ago, showing off his work of art that he had on the wall. And uh, the look on the homeowner's face was just like, really? You better never die, because no one's going to figure out what you did here. You know, to, to, the, to the homeowners, this was the space shuttle. This was the space shuttle heating their house, all right? So it was very confusing to them. To us, we were, we were very proud, you know, looked awesome at that point. Um, so interesting way to think about it. So let's think about why zone with zone valves, all right? Again, why not zone with zone valves? They're not new. All right. There's a lot of iterations been around for a long time. We've been making some of the zone valves at Taco for well over 50 years. I just got one the other day uh, from a friend of mine in Montana that was still running. All right. And it was built in 1957. So they will they will last a long time. All right. They are pretty darn reliable. They may not have been uh, as reliable. They were reliable, but they also had their issues. 
Uh, and I remember when I first started in this industry 25 years ago doing radiant design and takeoffs for people. Um, and, and I you know, was designing a lot of projects with actuators on manifolds for radiant floor heating. And I would have customers come in the door that I did, did the design for and say, oh, no, we need to redesign it. I'm a pump guy. Zone valve suck. All right. I'm like, well, what do you mean? They, say, oh, they just do just redesign it. I want to zone it with pumps. Um, but it wasn't just one guy. I, I got it a lot when I first started. So I started to do a little bit of research, a little bit of digging into it years ago uh, and start thinking about zone valves. Uh, and we've done this in other classes. But, you know, where was the pump typically installed 40, 50, 60 years ago? Was it on the supply side of the boiler or the return side? So we had circulators on the return. All right. And they worked fine. And we'll do a pumping away session, I'm sure, coming up soon. Uh, if not, I believe we're doing it in two weeks on Takeo After the Dark, if you want to come by there. But zone valve manufacturers were also asking for zone valves to be installed on the return side. And what they were asking for on the return side was mostly because they were looking for the cooler water coming back from the boiler. Now you jump back 50 years ago, our boilers were darn near almost boiling OK, I mean, we were running systems at 190, 100, 200 degrees, 210. All right. So they were darn near boilers. Right now, we don't call them. You know, we still call them boilers, but they're not boiling. They're just hot water heaters. Right. Um, you know, making anywhere between 120 and 180 degrees. Um, but a lot of times we're looking at lower water temperature now. So they're water heaters, but we don't want to call it a water heater because that's the other round thing in the corner. Right. So anyway, so we still call them boilers. Um, but they were looking for the cooler temperature on the return side. Now, the valve design, all right, is not as it is today that we're used to with ball valves. We had a lot of packing on them. and had to tighten them down. They had to be serviced. And if we didn't pay attention to any of that, now all of a sudden it would start to drip and it would start to leak out. And if it leaked out, what was underneath it? The circulator, right? So therefore, zone valves suck, all right? So that was how everybody started to feel about them and, and really started to get away from it. And then the world of double O's came out, all right? When before you're looking at your, your B and G 100s, your Taco 110s, big honking circulators, a lot of dollars behind them. Now all of a sudden these, the double O seven came out in 1971, you know, and it made it cost effective to zone by circulator rather than putting two of the big, take a 110s in line, right? So obviously technology has gotten a lot better. You look at this zone valve here, the zone sentry, it's a ball valve with an actuator on it. All right, so really uh, you know, give you the reliability that you're looking for. Now you start looking at wiring one of these things up with zone valves, all right, much easier to wire. All right, we're looking at low voltage compared to line voltage, uh, easier maintenance as in, as you can show here in the picture, easily pull off a motor, and replace another one without draining a drop of water in the system. Um, also looking at using a lot less electricity too at the same time. Um, obviously you're looking at a 24 volt zone valve here that pulls a watt and a half, whereas a 007 is pulling 80 watts. All right, so you start doing the math there, but you know you look at the average cost of running a circulator in your house, a standard AC style circulator, it's around $25, $30, $40 a year, depending on what your electric rates are. Um, not, you know, uh, that's year, not month, year. Your entire winter is going to be around $25 to $40 a winter for one circulator. So sure, that's a few dollars uh, that you might want to consider. And I think we should consider electrical costs. We're always looking at the BTUs and making sure that we have the right size boiler to match the house, to match the heat loss. What about the electrical load? All right, we always want to drop the beat, you know, the, the fuel consumption. What about the electrical consumption in the house? If the lights dim in the house when the heat turns on, you might be over pumping. <laughs> All right. So maybe it's time to consider zone valves if the lights are dimming. All right. And we start looking at zone valves in a system, and zone valves take up a heck of a lot less space, also. I mean, you look at that picture right there, and that's four zone valves in the length of you know half my arm. Imagine trying to put in five pumps or four pumps in this zone, in this space, all right? Not that easy where you need to be able to service it later on. So there's another advantage to zone valves. Now, me personally, yeah, I'm a zone valve guy. Why? 
because I know what the capacity of a 007 is. A 007 is a BAP, all right? It is a big ass pump. It can do a lot of circulating, all right? It's going to move a lot of water out there. So I consider it as a big pump that we can get out of it. A lot of people don't think so. We look at the curves when we get there, okay? And yes, zone valves are going to use much less power compared to a zone, uh, zone circulators. And then we always come back to the redundancy conversation. Well, you know, pumps fail. I got one pump in the house and zone valves and that circulator fails. I've got no heat in the entire house. And I understand that. I understand that conversation. But remember what I started talking to when I asked the engineers, how long do circulators last? And they said 250,000 cycles. And people are saying, you know, I lose that pump. I've got no heat in the house. Well, your experience or a lot of people's experience in seeing circulators fail is because we're looking at a lot of zone pumps. And think about the cycles that are happening now. The cycle count is getting higher in a shorter amount of time when we're looking at several circulators installed in a house. Imagine this right now, all right? A circulator kick, a, a, a zone valve turns on, which then turns the circulator on. The second zone turns on. Hey, guess what was going on? The circulator was already running, all right? So I don't, that, that eliminates one cycle there. Third zone kicks on, circ was still running, all right? Zone shuts off, okay? You can see where I'm going here, that we end up seeing less cycles in a zone valve system. So you'll probably get a longer life out of your circulator compared to having them fail prematurely. So a lot of people see those circs that fail prematurely in a zone pump application, not necessarily in zone valves, okay? Uh, so Lauren, it takes what, 15 minutes to change a circ? If it's properly isolated, all right? Could take a little bit longer, all right? If it's not isolated properly, you don't have the proper valves in place, uh, you pop it out, you know, you gotta drain some water down. So it could take a little bit longer. Replacing the power head, we're not draining a drop of water out of it. So uh, there's, yeah, it's not hard. It's not hard. Now, again, which way is better, zone pumps or zone valves? Neither. Now, if you are looking for that redundancy that you need in a project, because let's say your customer is an hour away from your geographical location where you service, all right, then the redundancy may be important. You know, if we're starting to see a Prius and, and uh, uh, you know, some electric cars in the driveway and we want to drop the electrical load by the customers you know putting all led lights in everywhere then it's important to to also consider that on the on the uh, uh heating side of things so again what did the customer look for in the first place they're just looking for zones all right they want some more control over their homes so let's take a look at zone valves because you know last week when john went through uh, uh circulators and pump curves and system curves uh, we need to pay attention. And he also went through CV, but mostly he concentrated on the CV of mixing valves when we started to need those higher head circulators. But when it comes to zone valves, we ought to pay attention to the CV of those valves also. And it adds another element into sizing our circulator, more pressure drop that may be associated to it. So let's take a look at the 571. Now the 571 is our old heat motor zone valve, been around in some version or another, like I said, since the 50s. Uh, and, and it has changed over the years. And a current standard, the 571 stands, it says it's a three quarter inch sweat model. And what that says, it has a CV of 6.1. If you remember the CV, the, uh, that, that CV value on the zone valve says, if you were to flow 6.1 gallons a minute through this valve, it will impart one PSI pressure drop or an equivalent 2.31 foot of head that you would have to add to the head loss calculation that we did before. Before what we did was just looking at the, the head loss calculation of the pipe and elbows and fittings that we had in there, not necessarily a control valve like this. All right, so the CV is six point. Now remember a three quarter inch pipe or maximum safe design flow, we're looking at four gallons a minute. So the higher the CV, the better it is. All right, meaning it has less pressure drop on our system. So this, you know, it has, say, if we were to add 20 feet of pipe to it, all right, by dropping in a 571. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at the zone sentry. 
the zone sentry has a CV of 10.2, which means in a three quarter inch valve, three quarter inch pipe running four gallons a minute, safely max design numbers that we like to work with says, if you flow 10.2 gallons a minute, we'll get 2.31 additional foot ahead through that valve. Uh, now let's take a look at our calculation at our system that we're looking at that 28,000 or 2.8 gallons a minute. And let's actually calculate what the head loss would be if we would use the zone century. And you can also use this for any zone valve for that matter, even the, the 571, like I showed before. So the formula to find what your additional head loss is going to be is take the flow, divide it by the CV, then square that product, uh, square that number, multiply it by 2.31, that gets you your head loss. So 2.8 divided by 10.2 squared equals 0 0.08 PSI, multiply that by 2.31, and we have an additional 0.18 foot ahead. All right, it's almost like throwing a pebble into the ocean to see the water level rise. It's almost non-existent. We went from 5.12 foot ahead to 5.3. All right, so it's not a very large addition of head loss to it because this valve has such a high CV to it, okay? Now we start looking at say our quick top zone valve. Now the quick top zone valve is it's this uh, um, uh, synchronized motor style design. All right, you've seen this design uh, across the board from from a lot of people out there, and uh, very similar numbers and also very similar CV. Um, and it works, all right, but need to understand what the lower CV can get for you or what it does to your systems themselves. So let's say instead of the 28,000 BTUs or the 42 feet of baseboard, we maxed out our loop, all right? Three quarter inch pipe running four gallons a minute. We've got 70 feet of baseboard on there. So our design, our system calls for four gallons a minute because we're also an industry that loves to push the limits, get as much as you can out of it, man. So let's imagine that we had four gallons a minute through our system here. Now we go with a three quarter inch valve, all right? And this version of our quick top is like, like many others that are out there, as you can see down here, has a CV of three and a half. Let's apply that to our formulas. So now we have four gallons a minute, not the 2.8 like I showed you before, but four gallons a minute divided by three and a half squared is 1.3 PSI, multiplied by 2.31, we have an additional three foot ahead additional three foot ahead that we need to add on to the head loss of the pipe itself we're now at 8.12 now in the world of double o maybe the double o seven might be a hair too small we'd have to take a look at it and and apply it to the charts and take a look and see if it would do it now you may not notice this issue when you first install this system where this issue may come into play is probably the coldest day of the year all right, coldest day of the year, we finally hit design temperatures out there. We've got everything sized properly. We don't have fudge factor built in. It's all this other stuff out there. And all of a sudden you get a phone call from a homeowner and says, hey, it's just not keeping up. Now, when it's 12 degrees outside, I'm sure all of you are just sitting around with nothing to do. So you're working on somebody's house, you know, and, and you talk to the homeowner and say, well, what do you mean it, it's not working? Well, my house is 68 degrees and I normally keep it at 69, all right? In, in most of your eyes, it's not a priority, all right? You're working in somebody's house where it's 47 degrees because the heat's been off for two days and you're replacing the entire boiler because the back section cracked off, all right? So you got a lot of work going on. You finally get there two days later, you knock on the door and the homeowners look at you surprised saying, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, everything's working. <laughs> and so you go ahead and you go downstairs and you take a look at it and you turn the, therm the thermostats on and the zone valves open and close and the circulator turns on and off and the boiler fires off and everything looks normal, all right? One thing to remember, it could have been a zone valve or zone valves could be the bottleneck in the system itself. So. Just think about that this upcoming winter. I know we're just coming out of winter, but think about that when you come troubleshoot a job site, that when you had that phone call, because we all get them every once in a while where it's just not keeping up. So uh, things to look into. So when it comes to doing my circulator sizing, now let's imagine adding a second zone onto our system. 
So my circulator demands, all right, uh, the second zone is a 39,000 BTU load. So yes, now we're pushing the limits on the maximum for that zone, probably the second floor of the house. We've got 70 feet of pipe on it. So when we do our uh, flow and head calculations, um, we come up with zone one, 2.8 at 5.12, like I said before. And now zone two is 3.9 at 4.2 foot of head. So the question I have for everybody out there is what is your circulator requirements? What size circulator do you need? Meaning what is the flow and what is the head? And I'm gonna launch a poll out there uh, so you can take a look at it. And I, I gave you the answers again. I gave you the, the, the um, what we're looking for. And so if you take a look, um, so we had zone one at 2.8 at 5.12 and zone two at 3.9 at 4.2 foot ahead. What flow and head do you need? What circulator numbers do you need to apply in order to make this work properly? And I'm seeing a bunch of answers coming in right now. Uh, and I'm loving it. what I'm seeing right now. That means a lot of people have been through the classes before and have seen the math. So this is beautiful so far. Um, and uh, thank God nobody picked answer number four just yet, saying, don't worry, just put it on priority. All right, do not put it on priority. It's just you're going to say, oh, well, you'll get heat to the second floor when the first floor finishes. No, priorities for DHW, man. We're not doing that to our zoning of the house. And now I know a couple of you are going to choose, you know, uh, choice four, aren't you? <laughs> just to put it in there, just to see, right? So uh, so let me, uh, excellent. Uh, I've got a, quite a few of you out there. I'm going to close that poll. Thank you so much for everybody that answered it properly. All right. And I'm going to throw it up there on the screen so you can all see uh, how the answers went. So the answer, yes. Uh, is correct it, it, that most of you chose 6.7 at 5.12 foot ahead all right so what you do when you are sizing a circulator with zone valves remember your two zones are running in parallel we got one circulator comes to a header goes to your zone valves and they go in parallel and come back to that circulator your gallons per minute is cumulative we always need to add up the gallons per minute because there will be an instance both zones will call at the same time so the circulator must be able to handle the flow going to both. Now, when it comes to your head loss, remember, they're in parallel with each other. So 5.12 is the highest foot ahead. So if you can handle five foot ahead, all right, for your circulator, you can easily handle four foot ahead, okay? So you don't want to add them together because they run in parallel, all right? So with that being said, let me show you a, a quick little example, all right? Now, imagine this, your house, all right? Now that it's getting nice and warm out here, I want everybody to have a little bit of homework to do this weekend. And I want you, to, this is going to be a visual representation of sizing, uh, of finding head in your system. So go home tonight. If you happen to get home early enough, go out to the shed, get your garden hose out there, hook it up to the hose, run it out in the yard till you find the first tree or fence post and mount it five feet off the ground, all right? Zip tie it to the tree, have somebody hold it however you wanna do it. You can do it in partners, all right? A couple of you guys can, you know, I'll, I'll share the list of names of everybody that's here today. Uh, oh, sorry, I did not clear. Thank you very much, Kerry. I forgot to turn that off on the polls. You can't see what I'm doing, hide. There we go. <clears throat> all right, thanks, Brian. I didn't, I forgot to do that. Again, running solo, you forget some of these things. So get that hose spigot outside, get your hose, run it out to the first tree or fence post and mount it five feet high. All right. Now, what I want you to do is slowly open the valve until water reaches the top of the hose and just crests over the edge. All right. So you can all visualize that. We've all done it before. We've all drank water from the hose. You slowly open it. You don't want to sit there and blast it out there. Okay. So just imagine that. Now what I want you to do, and here's where the fun part comes into play. Take this perfectly good hose, get your hose cutters out and a T and cut a T into the line right here and go to the next tree or fence post and mount it seven feet high. At this position, at the valve position where it is, do I have any water coming out of the seven footer? Not at all, all right? I got the valve still in the same position to let the water crest out of the five footer. It's not coming out yet. So I'm gonna open up that valve some more. 
So as I open the valve and get it to crest out of the seven footer, what's happening at the five footer? It's not just cresting over the edge anymore. It's shooting up a little bit. Okay. So you get a little bit more flow coming out. Of, you're getting more height being able to be handled uh, coming out. Same volume of water. Hose can only fit so much water in there, right? Do it again. Go out to nine feet. Okay. You see what I'm talking about. So if you can satisfy nine foot, you can easily do seven foot. And if you can do nine foot, you can easily do five foot ahead. So this is basically your hydronic system itself, right? You had to open up the valve in order to satisfy more to be able to get that higher head out to your system. So here's a great example for sizing your circulators. Add up the GPM for every zone that you have, find the highest head, and you're good to go. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a look at our pump curves. And here we're going to take a look at the single speed standard AC circulators. So we had our zone one. If you were a zone pump guy, all of a sudden you start looking at X marks our spot. All right, and it was 2.8 at 5.12 foot ahead. What circulator do you choose? All right, and we've got a whole bunch of different choices out here. And we know we're on the safe side, you know, uh, as we were talking about before with Nick, where he was saying, two foot and rather than the four foot per 100 feet of pipe you know yeah i'm probably double the size that we need it to be okay so we could easily have maybe dropped down the circular we could easily get away with maybe that 003 but normally we don't right we can probably look at the 006 cast iron circulator the 005 but we know it ends up in the project itself it's probably going to be your 007 all right, so, but the blue curve here is showing me, as we talked about last week, system curves, you choose the 007, this will be your performance. This is what you want. So you actually get going on just over three and a half gallons a minute and delivering about nine and a half a uh, foot ahead. Again, it works. We're just over pumping there at the, at the time if you were zone pumping here. And we start looking at our other zone. Now, even though it was higher gallons per minute higher heat loss lower head loss all right this is where we're looking at that four gallons a minute four foot ahead again all right we bang it up to the 007 we're looking at five and a half gallons a minute uh at nine foot ahead going out there now if you were to combine it and take a look at your circulators all right that seven gallons a minute at five foot ahead all right here we are we can still do the 007 all right and we will be you know and now we're actually getting closer to the pump curve i prefer when you start choosing a circulator what circulator you want to use on a project you want to look at as as we talked about last week the difference between your design point and the operational point you don't want to have too much spread between the two or how much white space is between the two of them so you want to be as close as possible so here you can see we're getting closer to the curve itself where the seven is going to be an excellent choice. All right, yes, now the circular is going to slow down. I mean, the circular is not gonna slow down, zone valves close, and we're going to operate over here when we get to those areas, okay? But you can see that the 007 is more than capable of heating this entire house with one circ. Well, let's do three speeds, man. All right, we stop three speeds and we, we pull up the 0015 three speed and the 0010 three speed. And we can see here at zone you know, zone one, all right, um, you know, 2.8 to 5.12. Hey, man, we're running on low all day. We run the second zone, three point at four gallons a minute, four foot ahead. Hey, single zone, you know, on the zone pump system, we're running on low. All right, we're never, we're not going above it. All right, and you combine the two of them. All right, we are just over low. We could probably even get away with keeping that low with my zone valves out there, all right? Because we do know, like we said, we probably overestimated the head loss that we have here. So even this three zone, this two zone system could easily operate probably at low. We're pretty darn close. Now, if your numbers are more accurate and you don't have as much extra thrown in there, then you run it on medium. Just remembering that it's going to operate at these points when the circulator is running for all of the zones. Right, because when you have a two zone system, it's a three speed system, right? You got zone one by itself, zone two by itself, zone one and two. <clears throat> All right, now what if we look at 
the E series, like the 007E. So here, well, I also have this 007 curve on there, straight up. The, the AC circulator is the green line, where the yellow line is our variable speed circulator 007E. All right, so now 3.12 at five, all right, we're going to be actually giving you just a little bit more. But at this point, we're not running full speed of the circulator. If your system curve intersects the pump curve on the flat here, it's not full speed. The circulator, this circulator will be full speed whenever your system curve hits the, uh, 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 the line that's on the angle. All right, that's your 44 watt full speed portion of the circulator here. Now we're declining to all the way down here to about four watts. So I would say right now we're looking at a, a 20, 25 watt circulator. Four gallons a minute, four foot ahead. All right, now we're running say 30 watts. And if we were to have it here, all right, that, that seven gallons a minute at five foot ahead. Yeah, when, all, when both zones are running, we're going to be running full out. Now, the beauty with this circulator, if it was in a zone valve application, all right, both zones running, we're operating out here. Now, this circulator becomes a three-speed circ, but automatic three-speed circulator. It is actually sp speeding up and slowing down as my zone valves open and close, and it goes between these three points, all right, zone one by itself, zone two by itself, zone one and two together, all right? So now you're looking at variable speed. Uh, and, and variable wattage uh, being consumed out there. And the same thing when it comes to our 0015 E3 circulator. So when you look at the E3 circulator, all right, you have your variable speed setting on low. We have variable speed setting also on medium. But when we set it on high, it's fixed speed full out. It never changes speed. All right. So we look at our project here, seven gallons a minute, five foot ahead, full out running on low all right and we have our other zone all right four gallons a minute four foot ahead now unfortunately it's not going to operate there it's going to operate up here all right it's going to it's coming up to the curve it's not going to hit down low it's going to hit up to the curve itself all right and then here's our other zone so now we can actually set it on low so the 15 was actually the best choice the 15 e3 was the best choice for this job site because I had that extra setting, all right, that I can go even lower and get really closely matched to what my system performance needed to be. So this circulator never runs at 44 watts full out, all right? You're looking at here at maybe 30 here, we come down to about 18 here and about 10 there, okay? So now we're starting to look at taking advantage of what the variable speed has for us, all right, dropping the power consumption too, uh, and also taking advantage of using zone valves. Now, if you're using zone pumps, Okay, you know, and if you did each one of these individually, you could do that too. Again, which way is better, zone valves or zone pumps out there? And as I saw earlier with the screen up before, it was 50-50, okay? So um, with that being said, oh, question just came in. Uh, still a little unsure why you would use circs for zones instead of zone valves. Valves are better for space, electrical, and initial cost, correct? Um, yeah, definitely. You know, uh, and, and that's my opinion too, right? Not that if you were a zone pump guy, you know, you your application might be a little bit different. You might have bigger zones. It all depends on the size of the zone that you need to satisfy, all right? So if you've got a bigger project and maybe you had three quarter inch or one inch, or you had a radiant system with three quarter inch, all right, that had the higher flow rate and a big manifold on there, you might have to zone by pump. So again, it all comes down to doing the math. A lot of times, yes, we can get away with doing zone valves for a lot of our systems that are out there. And based upon the poll today, we still see it's being 50-50. Uh, zone valves were actually hedged out zone pumps just a little bit, all right? And I think we're starting to see that market trend and that change go in that direction and start looking at more zone valves for systems today than we are looking at zone pumps. So especially as we start seeing the the adoption of the variable speed circulators if you're going to put a variable speed circulator in, in a zone pump system well one it'll never change speeds it'll find what speed it needs to run at if you use the 7 or the 15e and it just runs that that speed um so but you don't take advantage of it speeding up and down so excellent point there nick i agree um 
like I said, I'm a zone valve guy because I understand the, 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 the size and what the performance of the circulators are. But again, every job, most important thing you have to remember when choosing between zone valves and zone circulators, do the math. All right. Or I hate to say it, it depends. <laughs> right. It depends. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, Brian just popped in a question, pump or zone valve for hot water? All right, what are, what are my thoughts about that? Uh, for your indirect tank, well, yeah, that's interesting. It will depend upon the tank itself. Uh, a lot of tanks out there have a very high head loss going through that. So, that alone warrants its own circulator sometimes because now when you start looking at a zone valve going to an indirect tank and you combine everything together, all right, or the, the circulator size for your indirect might be way oversized compared to what you need for your zoning in your house. All right, it might seem better to operate there because if you were to put in, let's say we use the 15E3 and a zone valve for your indirect tank, but now my uh, the tank calls for, say, uh, 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 four gallons a minute, but the pressure drop going through is eight foot ahead or 10 foot ahead, we might be operating up here, all right? Let's say you might have to set the circulator on high always. So now it's gonna satisfy for an indirect, but it's also gonna run 44 watts whenever my heating zones call. So again, and, and yes, you still put it on priority at that point. So it will depend upon the tank that you've got. Um, Whenever I designed systems, I didn't have control over the tank, so I would design it with a separate circulator for the, for the indirect tank because I didn't know what tank was going in, what was the head and pressure drop going out there. Um, out there. So, excellent question. Thank you very much, Brian. All right. With that being said, keep the questions coming if you have any please do i will stay on as long as you like uh as long as the questions are coming in there um but before we disappear and before we hang up uh next week switching it back over to the commercial boys so brett and rich medeiros will be uh in charge of the show uh and they are going over net positive suction head all right so if you haven't signed up for it yet please do uh, it is on our website, takeocomfort.com uh, forward slash training. You take a look there. Uh, within 24 hours, actually in 23 hours, you'll get a reminder email of this presentation uh, that went on. So you can also uh, see the link to register for, for next week's class in that email 23 hours from now. Um, and uh, greatly appreciate it. Oh, yes, there were a couple of handouts. You should have seen it. One of them was uh, our catalog. And the second handout is what I call takeaways. And if you haven't taken uh, uh, grabbed one of the takeaways yet, it goes through some of the math that we have out there uh, and also a couple of places uh, for, to write down notes for yourself. So uh, if you wanted to download those handouts, uh, please do and, and maybe print one out and keep them for your next class that you have. So that's the, the takeaways is our uh, residential version of, of taking notes. So you can hang on to that and go on to the next one. So uh, Farshad, do you see uh, the handouts that are out there? You should uh, look on your control panel. Uh, if the arrow is pointing to the left, click on it and you should see a section called handouts where you can do the download. Uh, Matt, thank you very much. Uh, glad you could make it today. Greatly appreciate it. So <clears throat> if the, uh, I will keep on talking for the moment because I know when we're typing in some questions, it does take a little bit of time. So excellent. Uh, Steven says, first take of Tuesday was great. Thanks for the information to help me equip my new path in the world of hydronics. Excellent, Steven. Good to see you, man. Please come on by and hang out anytime, man. Uh, like we said, take of Tuesday happens every week. We switch between residential and commercial, uh, 12 o'clock noon Eastern. Uh, tonight, take away after dark part one, the what we call the West Coast edition uh, starts at nine o'clock Eastern or six o'clock Pacific. Uh, is Takeo After Dark, and Takeo After Dark is our factory class, our our two-day factory class that we've broken down into eight one-hour segments uh, right now. So, uh, and we're starting tonight with the West Coast edition. Tomorrow night would be Takeo After Dark Part Two, uh, going over heat emitters. So that'll be uh, tomorrow night at seven o'clock Eastern uh, for take away the dark. So I will be hosting both of those too, since John again is away. So yes, I am a very busy guy, uh, this week here. Um, Dan, good to see you. 
Um, Jose, good to see you from Peru. Awesome. Uh, Brian, thank you so much. You're uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, Dan Silvestri, yes. Uh, see you at the next webinar. Um, is the factory training full for the beginning of June? No, not at all. Factory classes are open. So there are still spots available for the May session, uh, which is coming up in June. Uh, it, they're all open except for the August class. The August one always seems to fill up. People like to make a little vacation out of it. So they come out uh, for a few days before and after the class. So uh, we always sell, sell out that August one uh, bright and early. So July, we just don't do one because again, it's a uh, more real vacations that people are taking. So we haven't had a very good success in July's and, and I think we also need to break ourselves. So, <laughs> so uh, excellent, excellent. Um, Lauren, central time too. Yes, that's why it, it is perfect timing for you guys. Awesome out there. Uh, Gary, good to see you, dude. Vince, you're very welcome. Matt and Mario, you're very welcome, everybody. Thank you very much. Glad you can come by. Look forward to seeing you all tonight, tomorrow night, uh, and or next week. So enjoy and have a wonderful, wonderful week. See you all out there.